Well, thank you very much for the introduction and a big thanks uh, to John Dirks and other colleagues at the Gairdner for the kind invitation to come and share in this very special week for King Holmes. And I wanted to uh, start my lecture. This will move forward. There you go. So I did some internet trawling and uh, this was a very young, I believe young King Holmes. So I had it verified because obviously I'm not, <laughs> I wasn't around at that time. I did have it verified in the taxi this morning. So grateful to my co-travelers here. This was presumably in the flower power era in the 60s, hey, King? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so, so what is, uh, I think here for me was a big thing for this talk was obviously that number one in King's hit list was the gonococcus. And maybe King will explain this between VD and STDs to us later, because uh, for me that was interesting that, that, that there's a lot of pathogens missing off that slide, just as you'd highlighted at the beginning of your talk. So I've, I was asked to come and talk to you about Neisseria gonorrhea, which we know is a gram-negative diplococcus and exclusive human pathogen. And it, as you know, is transmitted predominantly through uh, sexual intercourse. It is a resident in a variety of anatomical niches, and we're going to talk about this a bit later in terms of the oropharynx, because this is one of the key areas, uh, anatomical areas where resistance can be generated. And these organisms are particularly um, competent for DNA transformation. And this is an important biological phenomenon that will result in antigenic variation. It assists with DNA repair and importantly um, allows the organism to acquire a variety of antimicrobial resistance determinants. Um, also, antimicrobial resistance can be uh, plasmid mediated, and we'll discuss that shortly. So I was asked to give a slightly historical perspective, uh, which is one I think I always enjoy doing, because I think the history of this organism and its resistance patterns is, is absolutely fascinating. So this slide, for me, sums up probably what it was like to have gonorrhea in the pre-antibiotic era. This is in 1893, the screen by Edward Munch. And this is what you would often face at the clinic. The urologists were earning lots of money um, doing, uh, treating people's strictures. The, the long ones uh, that you can see, the long straight ones, are obviously anterior urethra, and those horrendous curved ones were the ones that went further down into the posterior urethra. And uh, Coleman made many of these, uh, and they were, this is from one of my medical uh, textbooks, uh, and that, that you could see examples of these in all the medical textbooks in the 1920s. It was also quite degrading for patients to have to go in. Uh, they received regular prostatic and vesicular massage to express quite significant amounts of pus, pus and other um, inflammatory material. Th then what people thought was the, the real miracle cure, sulfonamides came in in 1937. And from a disease which had very little uh, cure, it managed to raise cure rates up to about 80 or 90%. It was discovered by Gerhard Domack in 1935, and the first studies were in Germany, UK, and USA. And in fact, Domack went on to get the Nobel Prize, but he got it after the Second World War, as I remember Adolf Hitler wouldn't allow him to visit Norway during the course of the war. But unfortunately, by 1944, the drug treatment failure had started to emerge. And this was the first of a series of patterns that has come through the last decades. The next big breakthrough, of course, is penicillin, 1943. And um, it was first used in the US uh, military. Uh, and uh, obviously, you can see the posters here, gonorrhea can be cured quickly and cheaply, and the billboards there telling you it can happen in four hours, see your doctor today, the miracle cure is here. But unfortunately, what happened uh, was over the, the next couple of decades, a decrease in susceptibility of the organism. So the very green, the darker green is the most susceptible strains, and then a little bit less susceptible, this green, and the ones at the top are the ones which uh, have MICs above 0.3, so still intermediate. And you can see that gradually there was a shift to the right with more, less susceptible strains appearing. Now, by 1958, the, um, the appearance of chromosomal resistance was first reported. 
Uh, many doctors had got over um, the problem of this penicillin uh, uh, decreased susceptibility by giving high doses of penicillin and, and then adding in prebenicid as well. But once one got to chromosomal resistance, it was really quite difficult to treat these cases. And what we did find out was that uh, over a number of studies from a number of people in many countries have looked at the genetics. Uh, and it's actually due to three main mutations, the PEN-A, the MTR, and, and the PEN-B. So, so the, the PEN-A, we're going to come back to this later because it's key for cephalosporin resistance that we're seeing today. Um, that affects, uh, that encodes for the penicillin binding protein 2 the major target of penicillin and cephalosporins, and results on its own in just a four to eight-fold increase in the MIC value. The MTR uh, results in low-level resistance to a number of antibiotics, as well as dyes, um, and, and included in this is penicillins and the macrolides, so both erythromycin and azithromycin, and tetracyclines. And this encodes for a pump, an efflex pump, which is normally repressed by the MTRR protein. Um, and what usually happens is there's a, a, a problem with the MTR, usually in the promoter region, and so that is not made anymore, or made in less amounts, and, and subsequently you get de derepression and, and, and increase pumping out of uh, penicillin from, from the cell. And then we have a pen B, which encodes for the outer membrane pore in pore B1, B, which I'm going to come back to again later. But when you had the combination of all three of these mutations, you saw a a, a multiplication uh, such that it was about 120-fold times increase in the penicillin MIC. Now, King mentioned earlier the big uh, problems that emerge with the penicillin nase producing gonococci. These are the plasmid-containing uh, gonococci, which encode beta-lactamase, which breaks down the penicillin. No matter how much penicillin you give to these strains, none of them will respond. And this was a, a newspaper article from New York Times, courtesy of Jonathan Zenelman, and I think there's an interesting little section there I've put in a red box. It talks about the volume of air travel throughout the world, and the limited surveillance for this organism to date means every area of the world should view this as a real or potential problem. And I sense we're still in this issue now with the cephalosporins. Things really haven't changed. The gonococcal superbugs continue to be jet setters of today. And just to show you that the PPNG is still important. So in Africa, we talked about the problem with, uh, Bob talked about the problem of, of the belt and the PID problems that are running across that part of Africa. Well, if you look at PPNG prevalence uh, amongst gonococci tested every five years in Cameroon, this is what you see. And it really suggests that penicillin is still being used on open markets uh, and in, in pharmacies to treat this infection. So inappropriate antibiotic use, a key problem in many parts of the world. Tetracyclines were introduced in the 1950s, originally uh, used to, to treat penicillin allergic patients and just as with uh, penicillin, you had chromosomal resistance developed due to multiple genes, this time the RPSJ and our friends PEN-B and MTR. Um, and then a much higher level of resistance appeared in the 1980s. The first reports from the USA in 1986 and subsequently backdated reports to 1985 where these strains were found in Netherlands. And interestingly, the plasmids were both different when you looked at their molecular origins and the strains had different phenotypes. So these kind of emerged independently at the same time. And now we see very high levels of tetracycline resistance across the world. And I've just showed you that some of our data from 2008 in South Africa, where, of course, we use doxycycline to treat chlamydia as part of syndromic management. So we're constantly exposing uh, gonococci to tetracyclines. And we have over 70% of our strains being TRNG-type um, gonococci. Majority of them carrying the American plasmid and about a quarter the Dutch plasmid. Fluoroquinolones, as King mentioned, came around in 1980s. They were a very nice drug, and very few side effects. The only problem was it couldn't be given to pregnant women. But again, failures started to appear on the low dose. And we started a low dose first at 250 before we went up to 500. And it's again, my microbiology friends are always cursing the uh, STI doctors that they don't use antibiotics properly. 
started with low dose till we get resistance, and then we have very little time left at a higher dose. So this is exactly what we saw with ciprofloxacin. And we know that the mutations here are two key mutations uh, in the DNA gyrase, that's the gyre, uh, and then the Parsi mutation in topoisomerase 4. Now, this is an important area of the world, again, alluded to in King's opening talk, uh, the Western Pacific region, a the Asia as well as kind of included in some of this uh, too, but I'm showing you the, the Western Pacific region here, and Hong Kong, as you can see, leading the pack in blue towards uh, 2000 onwards. But I want us just to focus a little bit, if you can, in 1997 to see what was happening in Japan. Here we are in uh, purple, and it's just over 40% acrinolone resistance. So like many of the countries in the region, Japan moved over to use oral cephalosporins quite some time ago because they had no option. And cefixime was one of the cephalosporins that was used most commonly. And this is a lovely paper from Aito et al, published in 2004, and it, and it describes th three consecutive surveys. And if we look at the first one in 1999 to 2000, you can see in yellow the cefixime um, susceptibility, decreased susceptible strains were sitting at 0%. But by 2001, they had jumped up to a dramatic 26% and then 30%. The other thing you can notice here is the keftriaxone uh, decreased susceptibility, the, those strains kept below 1% throughout, suggesting that the keftriaxone was still going to work when the cefixime didn't. And that was interesting for us, because we are not really used to seeing if you give an injectable little work where the oral won't. But also very important on this slide, and I, th I think it's worth just mentioning, is, is because these, uh, these cefixime um, strains with decreased susceptibility um, are, are, are also have many of the same mutations as penicillin and tetracycline, what you see is the chromosomal resistance to pen and tet also increases dramatically showing that we we're getting a worse problem with those two old agents. And of course, these strains emerged within a, a backbone of uh, quinolone resistance. So also we saw a rise in the quinolone resistance too. And basically all that was left was uh, spectinomycin and keftriaxone. Now, the, the cause of this uh, in Japan, the cause of this decreased susceptibility was put down to mosaic penicillin a genes, pen A genes, which as I said earlier, encode PBP2. And what appears to have happened, and, and it's thought to have happened particularly in the oropharyngeal niche, is an exchange of uh, DNA from the pen A uh, or the penicillin binding protein 2s of other Neisseria. So for example, Neisseria perflava, Neisseria cinerea, Neisseria flavescens, uh, and Neisseria meningitidis. And in this schematic, what you can see uh, this is a normally uh, a cephalosporin susceptible strain, and this is one of the strains that had decreased susceptibility due to the mosaic PBP2. And you can see here where amino acids have changed. And then this is for Neisseria cinerea and Neisseria perflava, also the same part of the, of, the, of the chromosome of those organisms. And you can see where there's been a complete switch of DNA from this organism into, into here, and here for cinerea going into gonorrhea. So this is the, the problem. And it is up to about 70 amino acid alterations. So it's not just a point mutation. It's a big chunks of DNA get switched over. And, and some of the more recent work has suggested there's two key um, mutations, which is at 0.331 and, 3, and uh, 316 amino acids in the PBP2 um, protein. Now, Fairly soon, uh, it was discovered, um, also in Japan, that some of the strains that had decreased susceptibility to cephalosporins didn't have the mosaic PBP2, and there were also some strains that had acquired it, but which were still susceptible. So there are obviously different types of um, mosaic um, PBP2 proteins. So there's been some attention trying to find out what are the other causes that are important. So, so what was shown to be, uh, first of all, very key is, is mutation in the amino acid 501, um, which appears to be close to the uh, active uh, site motif of PBP2. I'm sorry you can't see the picture. It looks fine on my computer. I don't know what's happened there. Um, but uh, so that's, uh, that's an important mutation. That occurred in the non-mosaic uh, strains. 
And then also very important is mutations occurring in this uh, efflux pump that we discussed for penicillin. So, so a single base pair uh, adenosine deletion in the, in the inverted repeat seems to be the most important. And then also mutations in the MTR R gene itself at the G45D substitution. And then the penicillin B we discussed earlier, pen B mutations only cause a problem if they're there in, in, at the same time as the MTR mutations. Two characteristic mutations, again, associated with penicillin um, resistance as well as cephalosporin resistance, and that affects the uh, outer membrane porin. Uh, and then finally, uh, of uncertain significance for um, cephalosporins, but certainly very important for penicillin, is a mutation in PONA which encodes for penicillin binding protein one. So again, we've lost the colors. Um, sorry about that. Um, but uh, here you can see um, this is um, the, the keftriaxone, and here was the outer membrane uh, with, with poor B1, B, B1B sitting there. And, and here we've got our penicillin binding protein 2 and our penicillin binding protein um, 1. And here we've got our MTR efflux pump. So what happens is, um, the, the keftraxone comes in through the porin, and, and then it get, the deactivation uh, is, n is not so, so good. The deacetylation goes down, and, and the, 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 the um, cephalosporin um, remains there, and uh, therefore one gets decreased susceptibility or resistance. There's increased use of the PBP1 target. Here, with the efflux pump, more of the keftraxone is pumped out, uh, and then uh, also this activates um, the, the porin, and uh, it stops um, some of the uh, keftraxone coming in. So it's, it's quite a complicated network, but that's kind of how we understand it at the moment. So what's happened uh, is that uh, Neisseria gonorrhea has got MENA, uh, and we've had now three reports um, of uh, the extended, extensively drug-resistant Neisseria gonorrhea. Now, this definition was put together by John Tapsell, myself and Magnus Onimo, and WHO, Francis and Doa, because we really felt we had to raise the profile of this problem. At the time we put the, the definitions together, we hadn't had an XDR strain in the, in the world, um, but we um, felt it wouldn't be too long till we saw, and it was a couple of years, and uh, the first one appeared in Japan in 2009. The next one was in 2010 in France, uh, and then the third and the fourth ones were from Spain, and they were a rectal and urethral sample from uh, a, an MSM couple. So if we kind of look and summarize um, the uh, characteristics of these, I think the first thing to notice is the population group. So these are the groups where we're going to see the emergence, just as we have before, of these resistant strains, emergence and dissemination, so sex workers and um, MSM. We heard a lot about MSM in King's talk earlier on, um, and this is really an important group for surveillance. The, the, the first case was in the oropharynx, which is not a surprise. Um, and what has been a surprise to me is uh, that we haven't seen a spread of these, these particular organisms. So apart from the two transmitted cases in Spain, really these organisms came around, were detected, and they seem to have disappeared. The French and Spanish ones are thought to be the same organism, um, so it may well be that these strains are a little bit less fit, which could be a favor for us, uh, and they're not spreading around as quickly as the, as the fluoroquinolone resistant strains did. Um, in terms of susceptibility, we've really got spectinomycin, gentamicin there. For the Japanese strain, uh, it was uh, reported as resistant to azithromycin, as was the French strain. And the Spanish strain should be as well, but they used a different breakpoint. And there's one of the issues we have with azithromycin. There are many breakpoints on the market, and you can make it susceptible, intermediate, or resistant, depending which one you want to use. So we suspect it's right on the border of resistance. But other than that, they had all these mutations we've talked about. Um, interestingly as well, um, originally in Japan, the, the chromosomal resistance problems for cephalosporins were, were occurring uh, in the sequence type 7363 on multilocker sequence typing. This is a way of looking at the macroepidemiology. And that's now been surpassed in Japan by the sequence type 1901. This is the bottom uh, row of the, of the table. 
Um, and this was the same strain that was in France, uh, same lineage, and the same ones in Spain. And importantly, these are the ones that are linked to 1407 on NGMAS that is currently circulating around, for example, San Francisco the, um, amongst MSM. They're the same strains that were reported by Vanessa Allen recently from Toronto. They're the same strains that are floating around Europe. And we've just reported another sequence type 1901, uh, fact four cases from South Africa. So it's moved down to Africa too. So King showed the GISP data. I'm showing you the data from the UK. Um, it shows exactly the same thing, both for ciprofloxacin and for cefixime. You can see here, this is the proportion of, of strains that, that had decreased susceptibility to cefixime and resistance to ciprofloxacin amongst MSM, which is the, the red line, the blue line heterosexual men, and the green line is heterosexual women. So again, a big problem in our MSM populations. Spectinomycin uh, has been suggested as an option. Uh, it's not available in several countries, and certainly in Africa, it would be a very expensive drug for us. It has a low cure rate for the oropharynx, which is key, really, when we're looking at MSM and, and commercial sex worker populations. So again, it, it would be a problem there. And we know in the Korea in the 1980s, it was well reported that resistance emerged very quickly to um, spectinomycin, and it was just due to a single nucleotide polymorphism, so one mutation in the 16S ribosomal gene. And uh, more importantly, uh, as well, in Norway, just just been reported another mechanism of resistance with high level uh, resistance to spectinomycin involving the ribosomal protein S5 uh, encoding gene. So we have a couple of mutation me me mechanisms available now, and Again, single therapy with this drug is just going to cause problems, but it could be part of a, a multi-drug approach. Gentamicin um, has been uh, used extensively for about 20 years now in Malawi. Um, with apparent success, there have been a few papers come out with very good microbiology data to show that the organisms have remained susceptible, although the breakpoints are still um, unclear what the breakpoints should be. and and the, the, the MIC values are, are the reported from malaria only one or two dilutions below where we probably think resistance would start to occur. We do lack uh, co good correlation data between clinical outcome and laboratory data, so there's much more research needs to happen here. Um, but we, I think people are starting to think about, is it now time to use gentamicin? This is an editorial I wrote with Jonathan Ross uh, not so long ago to try and raise this issue and get us thinking more about what other agents and what we could learn from other parts of the world. In terms of azithromycin, um, the big area of concern here is Latin America. Um, the data here is, is few, uh, but this is courtesy this slide from Joanne Dillon uh, and collaborating members of the GASP Coordinating Center for Latin America and the Caribbean. And you can see here the black dotted line is the trend line for all the countries combined. And you can see how azithromycin resistance of defined by MIC greater or equal to two milligrams per litre has risen substantially um, over the last 13 years. And uh, also um, some countries such as Chile, it's a major problem. And interestingly, other countries such as Colombia and Peru didn't seem to appear to have any problem up until 2009. Of more concern as well has been the emergence of these extremely high uh, resistant uh, strains. And the first one, in fact, came out, was, was found in 2001 with an MIC of more than 2,000. Um, and yet it took until 2009 to have this case reported uh, in the literature. And we had the same problem with the Japanese strain. It took a couple of years until that was really out and about. So one of the things I think internationally we need to do is be able to report these strains much quicker and make sure that they're made available to all the key centers in the world where, where they need to be investigated further. But there have been similar strains reported in the UK in 2004 and also in Italy, uh, but thankfully these strains have not um, passed around to too many people, and it was just a handful of strains in England and Wales and a few cases uh, amongst young uh, persons um, under receiving a lot of azithromycin for chlamydia treatment um, who, who got those highly resistant strains in Scotland. So we've now moved on to uh, the era of dual therapy for, for gonorrhea. 
Um, and uh, for my own opinion, this is, is a little late now. We should have done it quite a few years ago, but we're at last moving that way. The UK is now recommending a single dose of intramuscular keftraxone at 500 milligrams given with single dose or azithromycin, which will protect and, uh, the, the keftraxone and have some gonorrhea effect, and also at the same time, obviously, treat chlamydia. In the US CDC, currently recommending a lower dose of keftraxone, and again, there's a lot of debate whether this is high enough dose at this point in time, 250 milligrams, given as dual therapy with either single dose or azithromycin or else a week's course of doxycycline. Um, and uh, the CDC and the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases have recently conducted a randomized uh, clinical trial to look at the safety and efficacy of higher dose azithromycin at two grams given with either gentamicin single dose 240 milligrams intramuscularly or gemifloxacin at uh, 320 milligrams a single oral dose. And this data was on about 400 patients in the study and so far it looks like the, uh, the safety is there uh, and uh, also the effectiveness seems to be there, 100, almost 100% for both arms. In terms of novel agents, ertapenem and selithromycin have been looked at. Ertapenem MICs unfortunately rise in the presence of uh, extended spectrum cephalosporin resistance mutations. So it suggests that one or two mutations in the PENA gene could probably render this drug ineffective quite quickly. Uh, it's also a parenteral agent, so not so suitable. And then we have um, the uh, single dose selithromycin which is under phase two safety and efficacy evaluations at the moment. Um, it's less prone to generate in vivo resistance compared with other macrolides because it has three rather than two binding sites. So that's a useful uh, factor with this particular drug. Um, so we wait to see the results of these uh, studies. But obviously these very high level uh, azithromycin resistant strains would also not respond to this drug. And then tiger cycling, we still need to evaluate it in the context of a uh, extended spectrum cephalosporin resistant Neisseria gonorrhea. For fully susceptible strains, it does seem to work. Unfortunately, we lack candidate drugs for XDR Neisseria gonorrhea in the late development stage, uh, and that's the big worry. Um, and potential candidates, candidates for the very beginning of the, uh, the drug pipeline can contain things like pleuromutilins, um, novel um, inhibitors of bacterial topisomerases, or efflux pumps, and then inhibitors of FAB1 or LPXC. But again, uh, this is very, uh, still a lot of work to be done on this, and we're nowhere near having another agent available to us. So really, what do we have to do now? I think it's public health. We have to contain uh, Neisseria gonorrhea antimicrobial resistance, and we must do this by working both with the drugs and with the people. So in terms of human infection, we must decrease the disease burden. Um, Diagnostics need to be improved. Rapid tests of gonorrhea would be absolutely <laughs> wonderful. Uh, prescribers' behavior needs to be influenced, consumers' expectations and adherence. And uh, in terms of the drugs, we need strong regulatory framements, uh, good drug procurement policies, ensure drug quality, particularly our generics, are, are working properly, and make sure our supply management is there for rational drug use. And the public health response has already started. This is from WHO and the European CDC and the CDC um, south of the border. And then this is our, our last couple of slides about the global burden of gonorrhea. So Bob already mentioned about the overall increases in, in the treatable STIs reported by WHO in 2008. But I think what's very important is for gonorrhea, we actually saw a 21% increase in the number of new cases compared to 2005, and that's very bad news. Um, and uh, basically, 36.4 million young people between 15 and 49 were thought to be infected at any time point during 2008. So that's the problem that we face. So the only way I think we're going to deal with this is not new antibiotics. I think we need a vaccine. I think that research needs to be put together. It's, it's, it's a challenging organism to work with. Um, we have several in the STI field, syphilis being another one, um, and chlamydia, of course, we've heard about. But a vaccine really is the only way that we're going to contain this organism. Otherwise, we're going to face another type of scream, uh, which is uh, in the post-antibiotic era. Thank you.